Hello, hello, hello. I am so sorry to have been away for so long. And I am happy to be back. Um, so, uh, no expectations that anyone's gonna... Hey, what's up? Oh, it's good to see a friendly, a friendly name face so quick. Well, hell, you ask a great question. And um, uh, I kind of burned out. Just kind of got a little burned out. And um, uh, I've been doing tons of like accounting and end of year bookkeeping stuff. Um, Hey, Jenny. Good to see you. Thanks for the purple heart. And thanks for letting me know that things are going okay on Facebook too. So, um, yeah, uh, I just like was going like crazy. Hell, you're right. Hey, Michaela, na? Sorry, dass ich hab mich so verspätet. Um, yeah, I, I, I kind of, I kind of just um, was going like crazy and and putting out a lot of content, and then the West Coast trip was sort of um, not West Coast, but westerly trip um, into the, the heat was um, was a bummer uh, a little bit. And then uh, uh, YouTube taking away our monetization also kind of sucked uh, for a bit. Uh, what's up, Vancouver Vixen in the house? Hey, Jeanette. Um, and... Um, yeah, there's no good excuse for it, but simply put, I was burned out. I was working too much, and I needed to take a break from live streams for a little bit. Um, and um, we were reopening a lot of different business units, pretty much open everywhere where we were working, you know, in 2019, except for Germany. So Prague's open, Paris is open, Lisbon, Oporto, um, Barcelona, Madrid. I think Liverpool's even back open now. Edinburgh, London, of course. Amsterdam's open. Um, pretty sure Brussels is open. It's just been a lot, a lot of stuff going on. So anyway, here we are. Um, and uh, um, I wanted to give you guys um, a little bit of New York, where I'm back right now. And our plan is to... Um, is to take a look really quick inside the New York Public Library main branch, also uh, called the Schwartzman Library, but not really. Uh, it's only because um, one of the big money folks from, um, from BlackRock gave a, a $100 million to help renovate the library uh, in the last decade. So, uh, hey, Andres, Andres Ramirez, en vivo, cerca. Um, so, um, but, well, we call it the main branch library and, uh, it, it's been here since 1911, which, um, it's a chunk of time now. Um, and I can't take you guys around to all the rooms I'd like to take you into because we can't film inside a lot of them, but, um, I will show you a little bit of video from some of those. Uh, my plan is to first show you uh, the McGraw Rotunda, where we are right now. Hey, Mila. Hola. Que tal? Uh, and then after we've taken a look around here on the third floor of the library, we're going to walk our way down through the heart of the library and then out into the front of the library, um, where we'll see our favorite lions, uh, Patience and Fortitude. And then we'll make a walk around Bryant Park kind of walking along um, between 5th and 6th avenues as we do the whole kind of square circle and we'll go for about an hour and we'll see uh, we'll see how we go and get on and then um, and we'll go from there so uh, hey Rebecca greetings um, and Jenny thanks for the purple stark over on on YouTube as well much appreciated so um, well, what was the good news stuff good news is we're back here I am I've got um, got a little bit of a tour for us today. Uh, I've got uh, 
couple other things up my sleeve. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to be doing a walk around of some of the best outdoor restaurant um, sidewalk dining areas that New York restaurants have set up uh, to celebrate the governor having just announced that they have permission now to stay for another whole year. So sorry, New York parkers, no parking spaces for you still, but for New York diners and restauranteurs, great news. And uh, we're going to go take a look at some of those cabins and those, those restaurant booths tomorrow um, because uh, they're super cool. Some of them are really ingenious, and that's going to happen at 4 o'clock. And um, I'll, put, I'll put up, do a posting up on YouTube and Facebook about it as like a reserve time for you guys as an event. And then on Thursday, I'm going to head up to Kingston, New York, uh, in the Hudson Valley, um, which was an old um, Revolutionary War town. In fact, Kingston was the capital of the um, provincial new government um, of the state, you know, of New York as it declares itself kind of independent from Great Britain um, and ends up becoming a, a site of, a, of a, a revenge attack by Henry Clinton, who sends troops into Kingston to burn it down after things didn't go so well for the British up in Saratoga. So um, we've got three tours from me this week and assurances from um, the rest of the the Sandman's New Europe organization that very soon they'll start producing um, a weekly tour in English followed by the following week a tour in Spanish so that each city that we're open in will do a tour a week alternating between Spanish and English uh, for for all you folks that still can't travel and for those folks who are traveling to know that they can keep visiting a city with us even after they've left it so that's the plan oh Shannon Missed you. Good to see ya. Yeah, I've been, it's been weird being gone, but it uh, just like feels great being back. I was a little nervous, but I'm so happy to be here. So, well, why don't I show you guys where we are really quick right now, and then um, I'll show you the video of what we can't go in to see um, at, uh, at the moment, and, um, and then we'll keep on uh, exploring. Jeanette asks, are you still going over there at some point? for setup or no. Oh, to Europe. <sighs> yeah, I mean, so Europe's been going along pretty well. Hi, uh, hi Chris uh, Ed, uh, from Spain. Thanks for joining and saying hello. Um, Jeanette, to answer your question about me going to Europe, it's probably not gonna be for a little while longer. We have to get a, we're applying for a big loan from uh, the Netherlands. Um, right now and if the bank needs me personally to go I'll go if not then I've been avoiding it um, because uh, you know look, I want people traveling but there's also been some spikage going on with the Delta variant I of course am double vaccinated with Moderna as are most of us here I think who are watching um, but I'm of a mixed mind and finances about heading over to Europe myself right now until we get a little bit more funding just to be safe and careful. And hey, if we can save a couple thousand bucks and plane flights and hotels and all the rest, then we got to do it right now because um, yeah, we got bills to pay that haven't been paid for a year still. So just the reality of, of what things are for tourism companies in COVID. Anyway, let's take a look at this room. It is the McGraw Rotunda, and this is the room that takes you into the Bill Blass public catalog room and Rose uh, reading room, which is what most people would know it as. It's up on the third floor of uh, the building. Shannon, Elgato is really good. Thank you for asking over on Facebook. Elgato, for those of you who don't know, is, uh, is my kid cat. And um, I almost want to just bring up a picture of Elgato, but... We're going to talk about the library, Bryant Park, and, uh, and we're going to do El Gato, a whole El Gato tour in the future, I'm sure. All right, so, boom. All right, so this great room here is much like, like much of the library, um, well, the entirety of the library, is in the Beaux-Arts style. And the Ecole des Beaux-Arts was um, actually a, a group of different art and architecture schools in Paris that uh, the two architects, um, 
John Carrere and Thomas Hastings, uh, who in the ultimate, you know, ultimately end up designing this building. Um, they meet over there in Paris together. Uh, and um, Rebecca, to answer your question, yes, everyone here has a face mask inside the, the public library. Um, and Carrere and Hastings, having met over in, uh, in, in Paris, you know, at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, um, they're big fans of this architectural style. And the cool thing about the New York Public Library is that um, in the time that it takes to complete it, you know, it, they take about four, four and a half years to build the outside of the building. And then they take another four and a half years to build the inside uh, and finish the inside of the building. Now, there is a couple of funding moments, but a lot of it was just the detail that goes into it. And you can see that in the same kind of flourish and style uh, that the exterior of the building and the architecture of the building uh, is done in, you have these same sorts of frill and flow uh, on the inside of the building. And it's the really cool thing about Beaux-Arts architecture is that like, it was about looking backwards in a way. It was taking all the best pieces of Greek and Roman and Renaissance, and Gothic, and, and bringing it all together uh, in this kind of backward-looking style. Um, and ultimately, the answer to Beaux-Arts becomes Art Deco, which was a forward-looking architectural style to kind of, you know, juxtapose the Beaux-Arts style. But this is a great, a great example. And, and in this room, what we're looking at are actually the different stages of the, um, the written word as it is evolving through technology. So over here, we have a medieval scribe who's like scribing away. And, and that being kind of the, the level of ingenuity at that particular, particular time. Over here, we've got Gutenberg going at it. And uh, I believe that is the elector of Mainz who he is pitching that the Gutenberg Bible is a great idea and they can print Bibles now. Um, and he's showing him a kind of an original muster, an original proof or copy of that. Um, ironic, not ironically, but interestingly enough, um, the first ever Gutenberg Bible to be owned by an American is in this library. It's part of its, its possession. Um, and here is uh, an, the American contribution to the kind of, uh, how do you say, the technological evolution. Um, this is a linotype. And the linotype was a sort of a, yeah, like a, a, a way of making a typeset. Um, so in this, you've got two guys, you've got Megan Thaler and White Law Reed, who are there. Um, you know, Megan Thaler is the uh, inventor, engineer of the linotype. Um, and our friend here, White Law Reed, who's reading the newspaper. Um, was a journalist, and in the back you've got a newsie who's hawking recently, hawking recently published newspapers there in the back. And then finally over here, we got one of our original important text writers or holders, and it's Momo, it's Moses, with uh, the tablets, kind of your, your original technology for writing things down. So. Uh, and above what we have up on the roof of uh, the building above us. Um, yep, that's right, Andres, Moses. That's who that, sorry, back to Moses. Moses the man. It's apparently him. He's white in this picture, but we all know he was probably North African. Um, but up here, we have Prometheus. Boom, boom, boom. And there he is, Prometheus. Kind of, it's hard to get an angle where everyone's looking the right direction. But Prometheus is up there in the middle, uh, giving fire to man. And Prometheus was the first great philanthropist, if you will, because uh, he, he gives this great gift. And for it, he suffers deeply um, and is punished and tortured by the gods for having given away fire tough call, Prometheus. 
But yeah, filio, philanthropist, lover of man is what he was for sure. Hey, Claudia, thanks for saying hi. Now, in this room, um, the, the Rose Reading Room, where we can't actually go, guys, what we would look at right now is something like this. And this is why I am showing you guys a little bit of the inside of the, <laughs> a little bit of the inside of the Rose Reading Room. And you can see all the, the, the level of detail that uh, Carrer, who was a Brazilian gentleman actually, and Hastings, who, Hastings, who was a New Yorker by, by birth, I believe, um, the detail that they put into to the, the, not just the exterior architecture, but the interior design, like those lights that you see there, those conical uh, chandeliers hanging down, that's, that's them, I mean, they wanted that. The balconies on the side with the three layers of, um, of books, uh, uh, bookshelves, that's them as well uh, and part of their, their plan. And even with the lamps on the desk, it was all, it's all those guys, Korea and, uh, Korea and Hastings. So pretty cool. Uh, Andres, excellent question. Was Prometheus one of Zeus's sons? I don't think he was. But you know, Zeus was pretty prolific. He, he made a lot of, a lot of half gods and gods and demigods and the whole thing. Well, it could have been. Someone, someone could check. Let me know. Prometheus, what was his connection to Zeus exactly? Other than that, I'm pretty sure Zeus is the one who ends up punishing him to have his liver poke, you know, eaten out every night and then grown back in the, eaten out every day, grown back at night and then eaten again the following day kind of thing. Um, all right, so let's walk through a little bit of this beautiful library as we head downstairs from the third floor, which is the must visit floor. I want to try to get myself outside of the building so that way I can take off my mask eventually. And here now on the second floor, ah, Rebecca writes, Titan of forethought and crafty counsel, culture hero and trickster figure in Greek mythology. Shannon says, in that account, Prometheus was a son of the Titan Iapetus. Huh. Yeah, great. Um, uh, Estrophe, cuando volverán los torres por New York? Yo no sé. Es, es una decisión por un otro colega. Demi. So, anyway, second floor. We've got young future librarians running around, doing the wave, searching for knowledge. Okay, but this is also a good place for us to be able to look down into the main foyer of the library. And this is where we're going to be heading in a second. The Beaux Arts style of this room really comes out. And you have all of these like columns, for instance. If you look around, you can see, you know, along the sides, column, 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 column. That is super Beaux Arts, in that it's it's like someone once explained Beaux Arts to me, like saying, you know how when they say uh, when they say, you know, when you're heading out of the house, you should always take a piece of jewelry off right before you go because you're probably wearing too much. Beaux Art, they said, was like, went the other way and said, when you're heading out of the house, add on six or seven pieces of jewelry. That's Beaux Art architecture. Lots of frill, lots of extra. Uh, but still, it has to flow together and form. So, uh, and hence, you get lots of columns, columns that don't often do too much other than look pretty right which is great oh hold on ah Michaela she does make a good point that spoiler alert this is where Carrie gets stood up in Sex in the City same building well ironically I came here to a wedding not too long ago and uh, my good friend 
uh, Mike and Mer good friends, Mike and Meredith, were getting married. And um, they had it set up that in this space here, this was where we were all seated. The library, of course, was closed. All the chairs were down here. The altar, the wedding altar was up here. And the bride, when she walked down the stairs, she walked down these stairs that I've just walked down myself. So you kind of see her coming down these stairs very elegantly to then come up to the front here where we were all set up uh, to watch the wedding. So pretty neat. Now, as we look along the walls here, what we can see are some famous New York names. And it's important because these people are philanthropists. They are benefactors. They're people that donated and gave money to uh, the support and construction of the library. Um, but there are a few people uh, who gave as much as the three names that we're going to see on the outside of the building, uh, where we're headed to in just one second. But I do want to draw your attention to just two names here really quick. Andrew Carnegie and John Bigelow. Now, often we'll say Carnegie, Carnegie Hall, you know, Carnegie Mellon. But Andrew himself would have said Carnegie or Carnegie uh, is how he would have pronounced his name. So you choose how you want to you want to call him Carnegie, Carnegie or Carnegie, the good old American uh, fashioned way. OK, well, let me get us out of here real quick. I'm going to take my bag off because it's one of the great things about the library is that they keep the uh, three and a half million copies of books that are here in the stacks below us. They keep them safe by making sure people can't steal them. And that means you got to have a, a quick bag check. Hi there. Thank you very much. After, oh, thank you, sir. Okay. Oh, a couple quick changes, guys. Hold on one second. Ooh. Okay. Uh, back to breathing. Great. It's me in here again. Yay! I'm back. Back and outside, no mask. Oh, Phil McCracken. I never found that girl, Phil. Whatever happened to her? Uh, tell me, Phil, where was... Phil says, are you going to show us where the old CBGB's was uh, on this tour? And... I actually don't know where the old CBGB's was. I did know the guy that was the manager of Mud Club, Steve Mudd, who I, I met in Berlin at one point. Uh, but uh, CBGB's, Mud Club, they're both in the same song, right? So uh, cool thing here as, we, as we're now outside the library, let's give you guys a quick view upwards of these, of these uh, founding Founding three, if you will. Let's see, yes, perfect. So the New York Public Library, if you can imagine it, before we had this incredible library system and we had libraries all over the country, New York didn't have like a major lending library in the mid 1800s. Um, you had lots of circulation um, clubs, if you will, where you could pay a fee to join into the library and there'd be a small circulation that was was around in 1878 there was a free a free circulation uh library that was created by ladies who lunch um who were you know they were quoted as saying they were uh putting together a collection of books to help influence um the young girls at the local orphanage in between their sewing classes it was that kind of thing and um, you also had two major libraries in New York. One of them was the Astor Library, which was like an academic library, mostly focused on, uh, well, yeah, academic texts and academic books. And then you had uh, the Lennox Library, 
um, Astor Library from John Jacob Astor. It's actually down near Don Lafayette, uh, very close to Astor Place. It's where the public theater is today. Big brick building used to be the Astor Library. And then the Lennox Library was like a collection of weird and wonderful things. Manuscripts, documents, um, like um, uh, Gutenberg Library, uh, you know, and all of that kind of like rare an antiquity books and such. And finally, um, the, the last important person that you have up here who kind of makes this New York Public Library take place like you we were saying, you have the Astor Library, and then you had the Lennox Library from James Lennox. That was like uptown um, around 70th Street, I believe. And he built like a impenetrable fireproof library made out of limestone. And then finally, you've got Samuel Jones Tilden. And Samuel Jones Tilden is a really important and super interesting guy. Uh, he was a governor of New York. He almost ends up being president at one point, um, but he ends up losing by one electoral vote in a kind of a Gore versus Bush situation where there's a contested election. Um, and in the end, three states say, oh, we're not so sure we can give this guy our electoral college votes. And it goes to you know, a mixed thing of the Senate and Congress and Supreme Court, and they put together a panel. And in the end, they don't give Tilden the votes. Um, and, uh, uh, and by doing so, effectively, in American history, it ends Reconstructionism. Um, the Union troops are removed from the Southern Confederacy states, uh, and this is like 1870s at this point, um, and Jim Crow replaces the Union Army in the South, uh, and you stop getting black people elected to Congress at that point again. Um, so it was a big reversion. It was a shame that Tilden didn't become president, is what I'm trying to say here. Things would have been very different if they had been. But um... <laughs> hey, Tage. Thanks, buddy. Good to see you, man. Thanks for saying hi over on, uh, on Facebook. So Astor and Lennox bring the books, right? Um, Astor is bringing all of those kind of academic books. Lennox is bringing the weird antiquities, like the Gutenberg Bible. Uh, he's got a copy of the Constitution written by Alexander Hamilton, which he donates to, which is in the library today. Uh, he has a copy of, uh, of, uh, of a farewell address that Washington had written out and read to his lieutenants uh, from uh, Francis Tavern down in the lower part of Manhattan uh, in the financial district. But Tilden, establishes the money that they need to unite the whole thing together. Now, the head of Tilden's trust was actually another guy by the name of uh, John Bigelow. And John Bigelow was, you know, good friend of Tilden's, was there, you know, as an executor of the trust after his death. And it's, it's Bigelow that comes up with the idea, we can use the Tilden money to unite these two, these two um, libraries together. And all of a sudden, all the other smaller lending libraries, you know, these little circulations of the ladies at lunch and, and all that, they all come together and say, you know what, we're going to throw our books into this as well. Uh, so that from the very beginning, the New York Public Library main branch will open with 350,000 books. Um, and and 25,000 of those books would just be for free circulation. Like, you didn't have to ask anyone for it. You could just go and take a copy off. Uh, the shelf and bring it to the front desk to, to be looked at. The rarer books today and then were kept in stacks, underground, protected, where only staff could go and get them. And up at that Rose Library, the Rose Reading Room where I was earlier on today, and I did that film for you, on all of those desks, there's a number um, at, uh, on the tables where you sit and you research. At each uh, seat at the table, there's a number because if you were requesting a book, the librarians could come and deliver it directly to you there while you're waiting. Kind of like, you know, your QR code for your chicken sandwich at the restaurant or something like that. Now, Bigelow, even though his name doesn't end up on the library itself, he does get a mention right here. And they name this plaza where we are right now, the corner of 5th and 41st Street, John Bigelow Plaza. All right. so get completely ignored because he was the man that kind of um, brings it in the end together. Now we got our lions over here. 
Originally, this line right here was Leo Astor. And his buddy on the other side, over there, was Leo Lennox. Leo because they are lions. Um, behind, uh, well, so that was their, hey, Matthias Silver. Uh, Olá, bom dia to Brazil. We see you. So um, originally, the, uh, the, the lions are named, you know, like I said, Leo Astor and Leo Lennox. But eventually, um, we have a mayor here, uh, Fiorello uh, LaGuardia, Mayor LaGuardia, who in the 1930s, in the height of the Great Depression, says that actually what New York needs is patience, and fortitude. Patience and fortitude. And those are the two attributes of New Yorkers that is going to let us make it through um, the Great Depression. And uh, well, the Lions lost their original names and they've ever been since known as Patience and Fortitude. Thank you, Mayor LaGuardia, uh, who also gave us a great airport's name here in New York. So how about that? Dos Leos. Um, over here, we have a, can you guys hear me over this, this um, blower, this leaf blower in the distance? Hopefully you can. Let me know if you can't. Um, what we have here is beauty, this statue. Beauty, old yet ever new, eternal voice and inward word, um, which is a little quote from John Greenleaf Whittier, The Shadow and the Light. This fountain actually has only been running again in the last five years. Uh, for the 30 years before that, so from like 1986 to 2016, the fountains were not running. So enjoy, only back in the last couple of years and pretty, pretty neat. Now, as beauty can't be the only thing that we have at this, albeit beautiful Beaux-Arts structured building, um, we also have truth. And let's walk over to that fountain. I'm gonna walk you across the street, show you a couple buildings, and then we're gonna make a circle. And we're gonna keep on moving because there's a lot of stuff I wanna show you. Oh, this guy, he's here all the time. He's the author. I promise you, if you come to New York, when you do, you will see this guy here outside the New York Public Library main branch. He's been here for as long as I can remember. Okay, uh, over here, now truth. But above all things, truth beareth away the victory. That's the quote from above his head up here. And he kind of has a, uh, looks a lot like civic virtue. Um, which actually, I think was the same, might have been the same, uh, the same sculptor who did Civic Virtue. But, um, so, Civic Virtue, speaking to the ideals of the, the things that, you know, in a, in a big city we should be striving for, is actually a statue that we did not see, but is over at the Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, where we visited together. Now, I'm just gonna quickly cross the street so I want to show you one more thing over here across Fifth Avenue, which is called Library Way. And, and if you look on the street over here, heading all the way over to Grand Central Terminal, what you have are these brass plaques going all along. Um, and these plaques together make up what is known as Library Way. Um, there's 48 unique plaques but they they match on both sides of the street so you have one over here and then you have one over there as well uh, and um, on the north and south side of 41st street these 96 plaques come together uh, the quotes on them were picked by a panel of of people made up of the the grand central partnership uh, as well as uh, the new yorker magazine the grand central partnership manages sort of the Grand Central and the Central Business District around here. So um, I wanted to show you guys really quick a build. Oh, I'm gonna cross back over the street. 
and just point out this really neat building over here on the corner. This guy is an attached building to the library. Um, so it's part of the library itself. And you guys can go up there to the seventh floor, way up on the top, which is where I almost started this live stream from. And there's a free access terrace up there. You do have to wear your face mask right now. There's also a really nice cafe, which unfortunately is closed at the moment. But this is a great place if you want a free terraced view of New York, you can head up there and, uh, uh, and you, can check, you can check it out. Now, this building, which is right next to it, kind of has a neat story. So I thought I would just tell you guys it as well. Um, this building right here, dun, 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 zoom out a little bit. All right, it's a modern building right now. This one was built in uh, 1988 by like an uh, investment firm. But from 1945 through 1988, this was actually the, the headquarters, woo, pigeons, was the headquarters for Lane Bryant. And Lane Bryant is, um, is an over, is famous as being like a, the largest retailer for women's oversized clothing. But as it turns out, Lena Bryant, Lena Bryant, from, who was the founder of Lane Bryant, um, she was, she actually was from New York um, and got started here in New York City. Not down here on Fifth Avenue and 40th, but all the way uptown, all the way uptown at 120th Street and Fifth Avenue, all the way down in that direction. And that's where she in her small store, which is also where she lived, um, she was hanging dresses on like gas spigots in her house slash showroom. Uh, and uh, one of her clients came up to her and said, hey, Lena, who had taken out a bank loan, by the way, and the bank officer had mistakenly thought her name was Lane, so he wrote it down Lane instead of Lena. Uh, and one of her clients, and he said, Lena, Lena, I'm pregnant. Do you have any dresses that would, you know, fit me better? And she's like, yeah, that's actually a really good idea. What if I had like a weird folded pleat? So it was kind of like, it kind of expanded like an accordion around you and then put some elastic waist, you know, ribbing around. So like as you grow or shrink, it'll contract or expand as you need. Work like a charm. There's so many pigeons flying by me right now. It's like a pigeon massacre to my head. Uh, gosh, there's a lot of them. Stop flying around. What are you guys chasing me for? All right, done. Um, the point was this. Guess where the first maternity dress is invented in the entire world? That's right, New York City, the Big Apple. None other than, than Lena, our good friend there. All right, anyway, it wasn't in that store. That's not where it happened, but same company, same city. That's the point. Yes. Uh, Mateusz, Botart. Thank you that you're here. I appreciate it. All right, let's walk along because this is the way that I practiced it. So we're just going to walk along in a circle in, in this direction. I was going to say, Rebecca, they're not flocking to me. They're mobbing me, those, those pigeons. Um, and we're going to keep this library over to our side as we kind of walk around. But you know what? I haven't really talked about what used to be here. And what used to be here where this beautiful library now is, which by the way, has looked like a lot like it does right now from a while. This is actually a photo of the library in 1911. I don't know if you can tell it's the same building, but it looks pretty similar. The, the trees haven't grown in yet in this picture, but it is the, it's clearly the New York Public Library. Been around for over hundred years here. The, the actual, the library group um, has been around for 125, over 125 years. They just celebrated their anniversary. So sometimes you'll see 125 written around. And that's when they founded like the New York Public Library Society, so to say. But the library itself won't be built for another 16 years. Uh, and it actually kind of opens to the day, 16 years after John Bigelow makes the decision about how they're gonna merge all those libraries, those libraries together. But what else used to be here before this right now was this. 
pretty much in the same spot that the library now stands, although it would have been closer to the street that I'm standing on right now, was what was called the Croton Reservoir. And really, the Croton Reservoir was part of a system of, uh, of a reservoir and aqueduct uh, system um, that, here's another view of it, but from street level now. And this, this aqueduct and reservoir system completely changes the fortunes of New York. Before it existed, the way that New Yorkers would get their water was not like really a great way uh, to do it. They were mostly drinking water from wells that they dug, and those wells often were conspicuously close to toilets, like privies, like ditches in the ground where you were going to the bathroom in it. And, um, uh, and this led to all sorts of negative things for New Yorkers, like cholera and like yellow fever and typhoid breakouts. So New Yorkers were getting sick a lot because the water they were drinking was basically too close to their poop water. Um, and, uh, and the great idea was created to go up to um, the upper Hudson, you know, up into the Hudson uh, Valley, like north uh, in, in eastern New York and build an aqueduct that would slowly allow water to to using gravity flow down towards Manhattan and the water collected actually in Central Park and uh, uh, this over here really quick is the the Astor Trust Company we just talked about John Jacob Astor a second ago this building's not built until the beginning of the 1900s but it is descended from him he was a you know billionaire uh, from the from the 1800s fur trader land speculator librarian um, but uh, all that money eventually trickled down to his family and you had this banking business here you had the Waldorf Astoria Astor Hotel Astoria uh, all that kind of all that kind of connection anyway so the aqueduct ran all the way down from Croton uh, in New York Croton New York in the Croton River it was 41 miles away from here and slowly that water would trickle down and, um, and it would take 22 hours for gravity to move a drop of water from the Croton River to, um, to Manhattan, to actually uh, to Central Park, where you had the first collecting reservoir. Yeah, Shannon, that was the ice cream truck over there. He's on the other side of the street. Maybe you can see him over there. That's him. Um, so water's flowing down, New Yorkers are drinking it, they're loving it, they're having a, good, a grand old time. They're really happy that it exists. Just real quick here across the street, um, this is uh, 500 Fifth Avenue. And 500 Fifth Avenue is the, the brainchild of an entrepreneur uh, and a state mogul by the name of Walter J. Salmon. Originally his name was Solomon, but he changed it because Solomon sounded too Jewish, maybe, I guess, I don't know. Uh, so, change it to salmon instead. And um, he made a lot of his money, yeah, from uh, horse breeding and horse racing. He was a thoroughbred kind of guy. Um, this building, the reason why I love it is twofold. It does two things for us here. The first one is that it shows us, uh, a, a, you know, an old Art Deco building. Um, the second thing it does is it shows us um, the setbacks that would have started in 1916. All of this space here where the building is set back in order to make sure um, to make sure that light and air can kind of get down into the building and into the space was a reaction to building the New York Equitable Building, which is a building down um, along Broadway. I think it's like Broadway and Pine Street. That's just me like going out of memory. And it was so big and so not just big but it's massive it filled up the entire block so that way in the winter the side streets the snow would never melt no matter even when it got into like the 40s because it was colder down there in those side streets which were always kind of in shade it also meant that the neighboring buildings before electricity right they couldn't get enough light into the offices which meant that the real estate value plummeted and that was one of the big selling points to 500 500 Fifth Avenue here uh, was that it, it didn't have any buildings right around it so you could have so much light coming into it 
it was uh, it was a real uh, it was a real winner. Um, this building that's next to it is is actually the Solomon Building, and it has a really cool feature, which I'm going to run across the street and show you guys. And not get run over, not get run over, Chris. Hey, Bar Shalom, Manishma. The say there? Everything good? I know, I'm sorry that I was a little burned out and uh, wasn't touring very much. So, apologize for that. Um, this whole street here actually was, was largely built up by our buddy Walter J. Salmon. And the thing that I wanted to show you guys right here um, are these, these great tiles. And this tiling is like a, a, a great example of Gustavian tiles. Uh, it's, this, it's a style from a guy named Andre Gustavio, who was uh, a Catalan, I believe. Um, but anyway, it's called, it's, it's called Catalan tiling. When you take these tiles and you kind of put them together like this, um, you, you, you get a lot of, well, structural support. Uh, and they're also, they're beautiful. I wonder if we can just quickly, I'm not gonna go in in. I'm just gonna show it to you guys from out here. And then I'm gonna walk away from this speaker before, it ca before the music catches on my mic too much. And uh, you know, cause we just got back together with YouTube. We don't wanna lose YouTube right away. Like it's a really neat little feature and maybe I'm just a geek about these kinds of things. But I'll show you a couple of examples of other places that you can see that same style of tiling, um, that same effect. This picture that you're looking at right now is actually the old abandoned subway station below City Hall in uh, Lower Manhattan. And you can see the tiling in effect there uh, as well. Um, here's another example of that tiling. And this is at the municipal building close to City Hall in downtown as well. Um, and the last place that you can see it, if you've, been to, if you've been to Grand Central Terminal and you have gone to the New York Oyster Bar that's there, the famous Oyster Bar, and, yeah, uh, and you went to the, the Whispering Corner right outside of it, you can stand on one side of the room and you whisper into the corner and it sends the message to the other side of the room, same sort of tiles, same technique by the same guy um, who came to New York in 1885, died in 1908, I think. Uh, Jin and Bar, mwah, thank you. I am doing, I'm doing much better right now, so that's why I'm here, right? Feeling good. Um, uh, Jeanette asked a question, can you do a tour of the underground, uh, underground abandoned subway? Yeah, you can. Uh, I haven't actually done it, but there is a company that does them, or has like the inn. Um, I think maybe the city even lets people in there every once in a while to to go and uh, and check it out, check it out themselves. Uh, it's very it's very possible. All right. Well, here's a building that I didn't know anything about previously, but very recently have uh, researched for you guys. It is the Aeolian Company building, built in 1912 uh, for a company that made pianos. And actually, inside of this 18-story building, on the third story, which I guess is like right there, uh, you, have, uh, you have room in there for 1,100 people to join um, and enjoy a concert in their internal concert hall. But the other thing about this building, which makes it pretty cool and interesting, is that it is the site of where the former Latin Observatory was. And the Latin Observatory um, was a wooden tower that was built on this exact spot all the way back in 1853 as part of the exhibition of the Industry of All Nations, which is basically like the New York World Fair. And it plays into a story that I want to tell you guys once we go inside of Bryant Park, which is right behind me, um, where uh, we had previously the New York Crystal Palace um, and uh, the story surrounding that. Now, from the very, very top of what used to stand here, the Landing Tower, um, the Landing Observatory Tower, you could see up to 40 miles away 
it made it an incredible viewing place to be able to come and enjoy New York. Unfortunately, it burned down in 1856. This entire block actually burns down. 13 different buildings burned down, all buildings that are long predating the buildings that we see today, but they all burned down, almost taking the, the Crystal Palace with it. But no, Crystal Palace survives, uh, but the observatory goes away. Why am I saying all of this to you? Why is this like landing observatory tower important? Because 30 years later, 30 years after it burns down, Gustav Eiffel will claim that it was his inspiration for building a tower in Paris. So how about that? You want to know where the Eiffel Tower gets started? Right across the street. I mean, not literally started here, but kind of like the conceptually started here. Um, over here, you've got the Grace Building, uh, which, you know, really the coolest thing about it is this, is the shape, is the design, is how, the, how it kind of pops out, um, expands towards us. It's an early skyscraper, design 74, 630 feet tall, 190 meters. The W.R. Grace Company used it as its headquarters. And uh, yeah, it's this, this concave vertical slope that you have here. Um, you actually have the same concave vertical slope on the other side as well. Um, but we're gonna cut into Bryant Park, but only once we quickly take a look at the most famous bathroom in New York City. Because refinishing and refurbishing this bathroom and making it one of the cleanest, nicest places that you could possibly go to the toilet uh, was one of the things that helps bring Bryant Park back to its grandeur or to grandeur uh, in a way that it had not had before. Now, very, very typical. This is the men's line over here. This is the female's line over here. There's no one in the men's line. You can just cut in if you're a guy. It's not really fair, but it's the way it's set up. Um, but the, uh, the bathroom even has like nice smells that come from it. You got these great guys here that keep it nice and safe, make sure people don't cut the line, which is also super important. Thank you guys for that work. Um, we'll take a quick look just to see how nice it is in there. There's even flowers and the whole thing. Thank you guys very much. Uh, and uh, so if you find yourself in Midtown and you're a guy looking to go to the bathroom, there's a really great one there. Uh, and it's like public, free, gorgeous bathroom. Um, with hand washing places and little pff, air freshener pff, puffing nice nice smelling airs yeah um, so yeah lots of comments about the bathroom but here we are in Bryant Park now we look at Bryant Park right now and there's a lot of people out even for this time on a Tuesday and considering that Bryant Park was at times described um, well, in, <laughs> on June 26, in 1976, there was an article uh, in the New York Times which described the park as having, quote, gradually changed from a tranquil island to a cesspool of crime and vice. A cesspool of crime and vice in 1976 was the New York Times um, evaluation of this, of this park. But, you know what, we need to go back a little bit further to really get a feeling of Bryant Park. And it's not fair to start today, and it's not fair to start in 1976. Let's go back to 1686 instead, when this area, as hard as it was to imagine, was all still wilderness. There was nothing here. You did not have the Croton Reservoir retaining pool, that Egyptian fortress that people would walk along, uh, while water was pooling down below their feet, replaced one day by the Main Branch Public Library. That was not here. You did not have the American Radiator Building, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit, this gorgeous, dark stoned, and golden uh, accented building over here. That was not here. Because in 1686, New York was still way to the south of us, right? It had not gone further north than, you know, sort of like Canal Street. We're talking 1686, guys. Like, the British have only been here for a short amount of time at that point. It was still kind of a remnant of an old Dutch colony. So this was all wilderness. But in 1686, then New York's colonial governor, Thomas 
uh, Dongan designated this space to be a public space. Um, now, Washington, as he retreats from Henry Clinton and, uh, uh, and General Gage, um, you know, after the Battle of Brooklyn ends not so well for the American revolutionaries, they manage to escape across the East River onto Lower Manhattan, he will cross this space, this empty area, with his troops in 1776, um, from kind of the lower right to the upper left side of the park. Uh, and then eventually, in 1822, the city itself acquires this space. They, they buy up the wilderness space. Um, and by 1823, what you have in here is a potter's field. This is a place where people who are not claimed by anyone else uh, upon their death and or are, you know, uh, they, they're, they're broke, they don't have any money to be able to pay for a plot someplace they end up being buried here in this, in this park. Um, so ghosts, maybe, except today we don't have bodies down below. We actually have stacks. We have 83 miles worth of shelves from this library, which extends underground underneath Bryant Park into this space down here. So uh, no more Potter's Field. Uh, in fact, the Potter's Field for New York ends up moving to Ward's Island, which is um, right north of Randall's Island in the East River, kind of separating Manhattan and the Bronx and Queens uh, up, up there instead. So the park that opens here to begin with first is opened in 1847, although at the time it's never legally named. Well, what do they call it? Can you guess? They call it Reservoir Park because it's right next to the reservoir, right? Because like that's what used to be over here, that big Egyptian retaining reservoir space, which saves New York's uh, drinking water kind of situation. You know, actually kind of a weird thing that I learned about that while I was researching for this, was that when New Yorkers started to actually use the reservoir water instead of drinking all that like poopy well water, which was like mixed with their privies and such, um, they, uh, uh, they ended up uh, artificially and accidentally raising the level of the groundwater in Manhattan because it's an island, right? So if all of a sudden, like tens of thousands of people stop taking water out of the wells, the groundwater level raises. So, you know, the, the water table kind of changes inside of Manhattan. And when that happens, people's basements start to flood. And because the rich people's basements start to flood, New York is pressured across both aisles to start building a sewer system instead. A sewer system to allow for that water to not accumulate in people's basements, but instead to run out of the island, run off the city, which was great for New York. It was like an accidental, serious upgrade in the infrastructure that, you know, because rich people's basements are getting flooded and their, and their wine crates are, are getting messy, uh, they, they end up building the sewer system. Byproduct, accident, absolutely awesome. Uh, which is so cool, right? Uh, thanks for the plus one and Jeanette, I don't even know. I mean, like I learned a lot of this stuff in the, in the week before I tell you guys it. And then most of it sticks, like, you know, like good pasta on the wall, pasta. Okay, anyway, um, back to Bryant Park and, uh, and its evolution. So 1843, right? We, got it, we finally have our park here. And that's why they're trying to figure out where are we gonna do, where are we gonna set up for this like amazing, um, World's Fair that we want to have, this exhibition of the industry of all nations. I mean, they've just seen how well that has gone in London during the London's World Fair. Um, and, and they're like, we want, we want that too. We want to do that thing because like it can show the world how incredible like American industry is. And the thing about a World's Fair is that um, you're gonna, you're bringing people together to, to highlight your inventions, your engineering. And, uh, and New York says, we want to be that because like we're doing, we're doing important things. Uh, you know, we're, we're building the, the, like the Erie Canal. Like we, we're, we're building tall buildings. Like we're, we're taking it seriously. So we want to make sure that we get this crystal, you know, we want to get the, uh, the World's Fair here. 
And one of the things that they commit to doing is building this is a nice little carousel here, which plays into my larger story, guys. I'm not just showing you the carousel to perv out on like people riding carousels. There's a, there's a, real, there's a real reason why I want to show you all this stuff. These guys got Settlers of Catan going on, a little Ziedla, huh, Michaela? Ziedla, Ziedla de Catan. Uh, and we've got people playing chess over here. Okay, so anyway, 1853 rolls around and the World's Fair is coming to New York. And rather than having to like ship your new tractor or your new machine all the way to London or to Paris, all you had to do was now ship it from the Midwest to New York. Still a journey, still something you had to, you had to do, but you know, totally achievable. So um, people are shipping their goods over here and they're building at the same time the Crystal Palace. Now the Crystal Palace will end up taking up the space. Let me get around. Hey Joe Coffee. We'll end up taking up the space over here, right? In that Potter's Field area. Now you don't yet have the library. It doesn't exist yet. What you have over there is the reservoir still. And here they build the Crystal Palace. What did the Crystal Palace look like, you may ask? Wait, what? Where's my picture of the Crystal Palace? Uh oh. Hmm. I don't know if I can I don't know if I can show it to you now. For some reason it didn't load in my media. Hold on a second. Uh, is it too late? Media. Crystal Palace, add, ah, how's that for a quick one? A quick handy duty duty. Um, can you guys see that? Did that show up for you? Let's make it a little smaller. All right, there we go, great, Crystal Palace. Um, and uh, hey, Di, good to see you, uh, and Michaela, that you never played Ziedler von Cantan, von Cantan is like a sad thing to me. It's a great game, Ziedler. Um, but uh, uh, Jeanette, to answer your question, uh, no, that's exactly it. The Crystal Palace here in New York does not predate the London one. The London one comes first and we copy it. We say we want to have that because that sounds really good. Now, it's actually designed by uh, Georg uh, Kostensen and uh, German architect Charles Gildermeister and was completely inspired by London's Hyde Park Crystal Palace. Um, and originally the plan was for it to be ready by 1851, but there's delays and delays. Uh, and meanwhile, like all of these inventions and engineering wonders are showing up in New York to be here part of the 51 World's Fair, but they can't get it open until 53. Um, but when they finally do, the Crystal Palace was, you know, a giant Greek cross in shape, crowned by this giant dome that you guys can see in this picture, 100 feet in diameter. Um, and just like the one in London, it was made from, from cast iron, which was like the big point that you could, take, um, you could take iron and you could form the iron ahead of time, like giant walls of iron, cast iron, and then connect them all together. And this was happening already downtown, um, like in, you know, in, in lower Manhattan, um, where you had these cast iron buildings. You still have a lot of them today and they're, they're gorgeous, but you also had in the Crystal Palace 15,000 panes of glass, 15,000 panes of glass. So it was this giant wrought iron structure full of, uh, of light um, and 6,000 people a day were visiting it every day uh, in the in the very beginning of its opening. It was really right there, and uh, and unfortunately, after the the observatory across the street burns down, this building as well two years later will also will also burn to the ground. Um, the Crystal Palace, no more. Um, during the time that it was open, it was a colossal failure, unfortunately. I mean, it did a lot to tell people about American engineering <laughs> from the exhibits, but the exhibitors and the people that sponsored the exhibits end up losing $300,000 uh, of investment money. 
Um, so they really, they really kind of lose out on it. Um, eventually, they bring in Phineas T. Barnum, good old Barnum and Bailey circus guy, uh, who was already having uh, the had the the famous and popular American Museum downtown, and they thought, well, maybe he could solve the issue of the of the Crystal Palace. Even he can't kind of resurrect it, uh, and uh, uh, he quits after a short amount of time working on the you know the rejuvenation effort. A few years later, the Crystal Palace, which again had been touted as being um, fireproof, unfortunately, unfortunately burned to the ground. Uh, a quick quote from Walt Whitman, famous American poet, about the Crystal Palace. He writes in the Song of the Exposition, a palace, lofter, fairer, ampler than any yet, Earth's modern wonder, history's seven outstripping, high rising tier on tier, with glass and iron facades gladdening the sun and sky, and hued in the cheerfulest hues, bronze, lilac, robin's egg, marine and crimson, over whose golden roof shall flaunt beneath thy banner freedom. Because that was the, the crowning thing on top of the dome of the Crystal Palace was that they had a giant American flag, of course, uh, on, the, on the apex of it. So. Um, yeah, Crystal Palace, Bryant Park. Well, Bryant Park, um, then after the, the loss of the Crystal Palace, uh, goes on to, you know, kind of get a little bit, uh, little bit run down. Um, there's changing in, uh, you know, changing in New York and where people are going for, for more modern real estate buildings. Um, you end up having, um, uh, the the library come into the space and um, and be built up by 1911, uh, taking those solid nine years for us to end up getting it getting it built. And there's a lot of questions as to what to do with this end of the square, the side of Bryant Park, which once held the Crystal Palace. There were a bunch of different ideas about what to do with what they still called Reservoir Square uh, into the 1870s. They were thinking about building a new armory here for the 7th New York Militia. Um, they had a uh, plan to maybe move City Hall up to here to have it be more centrally located rather than favoring so far downtown. Uh, in 1880, they thought maybe we're going to build an opera house inside of this space. Um, none of that ends up, ends up happening in the end. And, um, and Bryant Park, over the years, over time, will be used um, for training ground and mustering troops during the Civil War in the 1860s, of course. Uh, it'll have similar usages for gathering throughout the other wars. And I want to show you guys over to the side of Bryant Park. Oh, by the way, Bryant Park, why is it called Bryant Park? Uh, it's named after William Cullen Bryant, famous American poet, um, who was also actually a newspaper editor but in the end, probably better known for his great poetry. Now, we've come up on an hour and eight minutes already, and there are a bunch of buildings that I wanted to still show you guys and talk about, but I think we're just gonna end on my favorite building here inside of Bryant Park, and uh, we're gonna do a uh, Bryant Park, you know, Park Part Two um, down the road, because what I wanted to really make sure that we didn't miss out on over here is the old American Radiator Building. And the thing I love about this building so much is, um, besides being one of the, the early, like early skyscrapers here in New York or here around Bryant Park or New York in general, um, the, the American Radiator Building goes so far in using, well, it's the first building to use this kind of dark colored brick to represent more than just like a structure. Um, it is representing a radiator itself. And the dark, the dark brick that you're looking at here uh, is symbolizing coal. And the golden highlights are symbolizing fire, which together, coal and fire, going into making your uh, your radiator building 
uh, built by Raymond Hood and Andre Fuelleux, Frenchman, 1924. It's also, ladies and gentlemen, voted by TripAdvisor, one of New York's most romantic hotels, which they have uh, embosled on a plaque by the door. Today, it's the Bryant Park Hotel, no longer uh, he uh, headquarters for the, the American Radiator Company. But there is a really cool painting that I did manage to get here from our friend George O'Keefe. And here is her painting. Uh, what do they call it? Someone help me who is an art person. She was like a, a style of, uh, of painting precisionism. Pre she was a precisionist when she was doing this particular, this particular piece. And she lived um, uh, in a building close by here was able to have great views of the skyscrapers around around New York and did a whole series of works kind of uh, of painting them so yeah pretty cool all right well what do you guys think an hour is that good we're an hour 11 minutes now I know it's my first time back, so I feel like I should go longer, but actually, part of me feels like I should go shorter if it's my first time back, because, you know, leave one more, see you again later on, come back tomorrow, uh, and um, we'll, do, uh, we'll do a walk around tomorrow of, the, of what I think are some of the coolest sidewalk um, cabins for, like, really decked out with flowers and cool designs, and painted murals and things like that. And as we do it, we're gonna hop around through a couple of different neighborhoods uh, in Lower Manhattan. And I'll tell you about those neighborhoods and some of my other parts of, the, of, of that part of town as well. Um, and then on Thursday, we're gonna go up to where my, where my mom is living right now in, in Kingston, New York, uh, and go and, we'll, you know, I'm gonna grab some lunch with mom, uh, as well as, uh, as visit old Kingston, um, that, that revolutionary war capital of New York State when the British had already occupied New York City, you know, after Washington has got to flee in 1776. So, um, guys, it's great to see you. It's great to be back. Bar, so happy that you're here. Shannon, awesome. Tage, great. I missed you guys. Uh, Sarah, thanks for reaching out and asking how I was. Tage, thanks for asking. Um, you know, Jeanette, thanks for reaching out. I, I'm sorry that I've been quiet. I needed a recharge. I was just like, empty like empty like nothing left um and uh and i'm feeling just a million times just a million times better right now so so i'm really really glad to have been able to to show a little bit about a bit around about and the rest of it and um and i'm gonna start live streaming regularly again because I'm, I'm feeling it andres thank you bro take care as well to you uh michaela this is mir doch eine freude yes my uh, and, um, ah, uh, Nikki, Nikki and Ross, miss you guys. Mila, good to see you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jeanette. Um, make sure to like the video if you haven't already given it a thumbs up on YouTube. That always helps a ton. Uh, and uh, your comments mean everything to me, guys. So I really appreciate it. And, uh, yeah. You know, we'll take one last quick look around Bryant Park. Oh, I didn't really tell you guys what they did here. Look, here's the thing. I gotta, I gotta give you the punchline of the story, right? And the punchline of the story is this. Bryant Park by the 70s was not a safe place to be. People were getting mugged here during the late afternoons. So people were avoiding it. And, um, and they changed two funda or three fundamental things, right? To take the park back for the people. Okay, so I can just show them to you really quick. One of them is right here. These chairs. Movable chairs. Allowing people to move chairs and move the tables themselves changed the psychology of the park. It made local people feel like this was their park because they could come and move things around. Someone steals one of these chairs? Eh, okay, fine, someone steals one of those chairs. They're not that great chairs. But that people could hold on to the chairs themselves um, and like move them around just made them feel like, oh, hey, you wanna have lunch? Let's grab these chairs and like, we're just gonna sit in some chairs right now. Let's do that. 
and, and they felt ownership. Same thing they did around Times Square was really, really effective. The second thing that they did was they put in all of these attractions that you can see around the park. You got some restaurants, you got some clean bathrooms, you've got a patank uh, or bull uh, throwing space, you've got uh, ping pong tables, chess tables, uh, you've got a, a, a lending library, like a reading library, you can just come take books right here in the park from a bookshelf that they have here. Uh, they've got concerts and, uh, and movies at night. All of that stuff, concerts and movies get shown. All of that stuff meant that people would be like, you know what, like there's something to do here besides buy drugs or like meet a prostitute. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna come and hang out in Bryant Park. The third thing that they did, which was really important, and I'll just show you guys this as we, as we walk, uh, walk out of the park, is that, that the iteration of the park through the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, it had high hedges, right? High hedges. And you also um, had to walk up stairs to get into the park, which meant it was raised from street level. And those two things, being raised from street level and having hedges that kind of closed in the park meant that people didn't feel invited to walk into it. They couldn't see what was going on inside, which meant the people inside knew that they couldn't be seen by the people on the outside of the park either. And that all led to the park like having a little bit more weird stuff uh, taking place. So the third thing that they do to change the park was they cut down the hedges and they lower the entire park. They make it lower to the ground so people could see directly into the park. Anyway, take that as a model of how they save Bryant Park ultimately. Uh, games and activities, food, clean bathrooms, movable chairs and tables, and, uh, and, and visibility, right? To let you see in and out of it. Tons of pigeons. Ooh, they're coming at me again. All right, that's it. For real, for real, goodbye. Looking forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. We're gonna walk around uh, Lower Manhattan, hitting some of those, those restaurant cabins and um, talking about some great, great places to, to go eat as New York reopens and is reopened. And we can celebrate that we're gonna have street eating in New York for another year. Thank you, Governor Cuomo, for this. Um, mwah, thank you guys. And uh, class uh, one, class one, Thanks for joining from Russia. You caught the end. Always good to see you. Uh, I really want to, we did a tour of Moscow not too long ago, but I really want to do a live stream of St. Petersburg. So bad. Anyway, class one, class one, if you know someone, let me know. See you guys tomorrow. Thanks for being back. It's really, really, it means the world to me to come back online for my first live stream in a couple of weeks and see so many friendly faces. So thank you guys. Uh, I appreciate you. Um, we'll see each other again very soon. Ciao.